Good morning. Good morning. We're here for the one year Bible study. <clears throat> it's February the 9th of 2018. Fabulous Friday. Um, reading was good this morning and I was just sitting here talking to Tom telling him I felt like the Lord humbled me a little bit this morning, uh, which is always a good thing. Always a good thing. Because the scripture says, if my children will humble and pray, then his blessings will come on us. So um, anyway, we're reading Exodus 29 and 30. And, and it's uh, all about the sacrifices. So this is going to lead up into Leviticus, um, the book of sacrifices. <clears throat> good morning, Kelly Blankenship. I love you too. Um, good morning. It's all about the sacrifices leading up to the Leviticus, the book of sacrifices. And, you know, Aaron was a chief priest and his sons was made priests. And um, you can't help but when you read this, think, wow. I mean, once again, God shows how important the details are to him. Uh, every detail. He didn't overlook anything. And... He taught um, Aaron these details. And just listening to, to what they had to do, um, verse 15 in Exodus 29, next Aaron and his sons must lay his hands on the head of one of the rams, then slaughter the ram and splatter its blood against all sides of the altar. Cut the ram into pieces and wash off the internal organs and the legs. Set them alongside the head and the other pieces of the body. I mean, I know there's a lot of people that's watching this and listening to this that has never watched a butcher cut off a leg from a, a ram or from a, a bull or from a calf. Um, that's not something that just happens in a couple of seconds. Everything that's being described here took a lot of time a lot of time then burn the entire animal on the altar see we read that and it goes this fast i mean we just read through it we're done and we think oh wow that was quite a sacrifice <clears throat> but that you know what did they have to do to start a fire back then they didn't have matches they didn't have gasoline that they could throw on it as an accelerator uh, what did it take just to get the fire started and so the fire had to be started and then um, burn the entire animal on the altar. How long does it take to burn an entire animal? This is a burnt offering to the Lord. It's a pleasing aroma. Oh, that, those words, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. I want to come back to that. I hope I remember that today. Now take the other ram and have Aaron and his sons lay their hands on its head, then slaughter it and apply some of the blood to the right earlobes of Aaron. And, to, and his sons also put it on the thumbs of the right hand. And then it goes on, it continues on, but then it talks about uh, taking the, uh, the fat from all different parts of this animal, from the kidneys, from the liver, from the entrails, from the backbone. And, and it's talking about all these intricate. So I think you get my point. You get my point. And so <clears throat> as I read this, who was Aaron? He was the chief priest. Who, were, who was Aaron's sons? They were the priests. They, the, they were the ones called. Are you called? Are you called? How many days did it take just to get through these sacrifices? And I just felt like God was just showing me that I should look at every day. Now, now, please understand me. We are under grace. I don't have to do anything. But because of my faith, I have to do everything I'm called to do. There, there is such a fine line, and I've been guilty of allowing <laughs> of allowing what faith does in me, faith motivates me into action. 
And I've been guilty of allowing that motivation into action rather than just act, uh, the, the action of faith. I've, I've crossed the line into action of works, meaning that I worked hard so that I could get God's favor. And that is not where we're at um, in 2018 after the death of Christ. We're in grace. I don't have to do anything. <clears throat> but because of my faith, I can't, I can't remain idle. So, so in that, in that truth, then God was showing me how I, I, I fill up my days, just like Aaron's days were full, just like his son's days were full. Those that are called and, and every little detail about sprinkling the blood on Aaron's earlobes is so important to God. So every single time uh, Brooke picks up the phone and follows up with a client, every single time she writes down an agenda item, or every single time she tracks this or that, or every time uh, Rebecca picks up a folder and makes those phone calls, and every single time Shannon sweeps a corner out and every single time each one of us you know does exactly what we're when tom sets down to do the books and every number he writes down is a type and shadow of everything aaron and the priests were doing and there's not one detail that's not important there is not one detail that's not now think about the care that aaron and his sons had to take because if they missed a detail, they died. Praise God, we're not under the law. All of a sudden, we'd be way more careful with the work that God's called us to do. And I, and I said, he's humbled me this morning. Uh, reading this humbled me in that, do I take my time on the details? Do I not forget this and forget that? I mean, anybody that knows me knows that I can fill my plate so full that I use that as the excuse that, oh, I forgot. Oh, I didn't get this done. Oh, I, I missed that. And every detail is important. We have to look at our day to day as a call from God. And every minute is important. Every minute. So how much time do I do I do picking up my phone and looking at my phone for personal stuff, not business stuff when, when I'm working, when I'm supposed to be working? How many personal phone calls do I entertain during the day uh, when I'm supposed to be doing what I'm called to? I'm, I'm telling you, it, it touched me deeply today. And then it goes into Matthew 26. And again, all these scriptures, these readings, Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs, fits together like a piece of a puzzle each day for me. And so, <clears> hmm, <throat> Peter, I, I just, I will just tell y'all that I guess reading and getting and having God speak to me about my day and about the details he's called me to and how important those details are. And then reading about Peter, I, I saw myself in Peter. You know, he's, he's, he's telling them, he's preparing for the Passover, and, and he's, he, he's not even bashful about it. You know, first and foremost, he tells them, you know, somebody's going to betray him. So I want to talk about that, and then I'll talk about Peter. First and foremost, he tells them um, that he tells them that they're going to kill him. I mean, this is another one of those times. I keep emphasizing that because of their response when it happens, um, they knew Jesus himself told them. But then he's preparing for this Passover. They're at the Passover, the last meal that they get to have with him. He's telling them it's the last time that they'll have a meal together. And then he tells them that somebody's going to betray him. So um, this, this reading in today's Scriptures, Matthew 26, verse 14, starts off with Judas going to the 12, uh, of, of the 12 disciples, going to the leading priests and asking, how much will, it, will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they, of course, we all know it was 30 coins of silver. Um, and then, what, again, a, just a different perspective today. How did Jesus handle this? 
knowing one of his closest 12. They traveled together 24 hours a day. They ate together. I mean, all of the personal intimate things you do when you are um, tight with somebody. I mean, more so than all of us working here together. We're, we're close here. We get to know each other on a new level, just coming in daily and working together. But we're not sleeping together. We're not waking up with bad breath with each other together. We're not saying, oh, I have to find a place to go relieve myself because there's no bathroom together. Do you all understand what I'm saying? There was an intimacy with this group. Not only that, but Jesus called these 12. He handpicked them as his 12. The, the 12 disciples, and yet he knew, he knew one of the closest people to him would betray him. And what I saw today, Jesus never skipped a beat. He never changed his demeanor towards anyone. Do you know, somebody can just say something and tick us off or hurt our feelings and our whole mood changes for three days. Uh, I mean, everything about us changes. The way we look out of our eyes, the sparkle's gone, we don't smile. And uh, oh my goodness, guys, our whole demeanor, his whole demeanor, knowing up front, see, he had the benefit of knowing in advance Judas was going to betray him. And he never stopped. He never stopped acting in love towards Judas. Never. And including, as we know, it's not in today's reading, including allowing, allowing the betrayal to happen in the form of a kiss. Jesus kissed, uh, Judas kissed him on the cheek to betray who he was. And Jesus never changed. He never changed his demeanor. There is no up, uh, ups and downs emotionally with Jesus. And I just, you know, what if we just acted as though it didn't happen? I mean, that's really what Jesus died to give us is the ability to acknowledge the betrayal. That's what Jesus did. He acknowledged it. In fact, he foretold it. And then he confirmed it with his words. In our reading today, Judas asked him, is it I? I thought that was so funny that he would ask, is it I? When it starts off in the first sentence that we read is that Judas went to the leading priest and asked, how much will you pay me to betray him to you? <coughs> and then when Jesus at the supper says, one of you will betray me, they all talked amongst themselves about who it would be. And then Judas says, is it I? And, and Jesus said, as you spoke it so, uh, and, and he never changed. He never changed. <laughs> I mean, wars are started over betrayal. Families are split up. Friendships are ended. We quit our job because somebody betrays us. We get divorced because of a betrayal. And I think that kiss is significant in marriage. Oftentimes, it's a perceived betrayal. Oftentimes, it's our own spirit of rejection that we're operating under when the other person doesn't have a clue they even, that you're even feeling rejected or betrayed. And yet, we have this example here today. I, I, I hope you guys can sense for Elizabeth Inman, Elizabeth, this is speaking to me about my demeanor, about how I act. When I act, I told you he humbled me today. Self-righteous when I act. Oh, there's, a, there's a number of words that can be used. And, and Lord, forgive me. And Father, change me. Change me as I read these words about your son and the example he set in human form. <clears throat> hmm. um, so then, then it goes on, and Peter then um, as I said, I saw myself and Peter as well this morning. Here's the deal. Peter's been traveling with him. They've had miracles. They've seen all this stuff. And I think Peter just got just a little bit full of himself. And, and please hear me again. This is a fine line. This is one of those really fine lines. Peter's confident. He's called. Jesus called him himself personally. 
he is one of the elite 12. They see things about this teacher that the, that the entire region is talking about that nobody else sees. He has the intimate details of Jesus. And here's the deal. He knows that he knows Jesus loves him. And with everything in his mortal body, Peter believes he loves him. And so when Jesus said <clears throat> that they're going to come and kill him, Peter tells him, oh, no, I, I, will, I will fight for you. I, they, they won't come and get you. I'll fight for you, even if it means that I die for you. When Jesus said, no, you won't, he says, even if it means that I die, I'll die for you. And in that moment, he meant it. I think he meant it. That's what I felt this morning. Peter meant it, but Peter had stepped over into just a little bit of arrogance of who he was with Christ. We can step over just a little bit into arrogance of who we are in Christ. A little bit of self-righteousness of, oh, I'm good at my job. I don't, I don't miss things. No, 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 no. I mean, he, he blurted out. He blurted out. You know, no, no, this can't happen. I'll, I'll, go to, I'll go to the ends of the earth for you. I'll die for you. And then, of course, Jesus tells him that um, before, the, before that evening is up, he'll deny him three times. And Peter just can't believe that. Now, now, here's the part that I think I've missed. I just hadn't quite wove this together. I wasn't ready, probably. I think the Holy Spirit did this for me. But... I took this to that next step that what happened, you know, Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane and, and again, you know, he's telling them he's troubled. The Bible in some translations will say he was so troubled that he bled blood, that he sweated blood. Um, his heart was troubled. This is the only time in scripture we see really where Jesus's emotions changed. Now, I, I just got to check in my spirit. His emotions changed when he ran the money changers out of the temple because he had a righteous anger. But this was a different type of emotion. It was, he was troubled, the Bible says. He was troubled. And they couldn't even stay awake for an hour with him. And then Jesus comes back and rebukes them and says, you can't stay awake an hour. And then he takes Peter and the brothers. Significant that it was Peter deeper with him into the garden. And, and, and then Jesus has his one-on-one -on -one time with God. And this, this is where my mind went today as I'm reading. And then they come and arrested Jesus. So Judas betrays him with a kiss. That will preach. And then Peter jumps up with his sword and cut off the soldier's ear. Now this, remember I said he had, he had, I sensed that he had stepped over into a self-righteousness uh, ego. Uh, he just let he just he just let himself get just a little bit a little bit too confident in who he was in, with Jesus. And contrary to God's good and purple per per perfect will. He acted. And in that moment, you know what? When he drew that sword, he said, he did what he said he would do, that he would fight for Jesus to the death. Make no mistake about it, Jesus, uh, Peter loved Jesus. He loved him. And he would have in that moment. When he drew the sword, when the soldiers were, this is the part I hadn't ever quite seen before but it was contrary to God's good and perfect will. It was not what was supposed to happen that Peter was to stop the death of Jesus Christ. So once again, Peter was with God, with Jesus, with God, with Jesus. We're in Jesus, big difference. Big, big difference. We're in him and he's in us. And I just, once again, I don't want to get so confident in the call. I don't want to get so confident as I grow, as I continue to <clears throat> know him better, as, I, as he continues to reveal himself to me, 
I don't want to get so confident that I think I know what God's good and perfect will is, that I would choose to cut off the soldier's ear instead of allow the greatest event ever to happen on earth to happen and unfold. I, I don't want to interfere with my kids because I think I'm their mother. I don't want to interfere in this business because I'm the owner. I don't want to interfere in God's good and perfect will with my grandkids. I don't want to interfere. I want to be a, a, a funnel, as he told me at the beginning of this year to be. I want to open myself up wide and see, I'll, I'll end with this. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to read the Proverbs because it all fits so good. Besides, Brooke won't let me not mm -hmm. read the Proverbs. But, but see, if I'm operating under a sense of betrayal, if I'm operating under a sense of rejection, if I'm operating under what's been done to me, I can't hear my father. I will, I will step up in false confidence and defend myself. I will step up in false confidence. I'm going to say it again and defend myself when the Bible says that God is our vindicator. God fights our battles for us. Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. God will fight our battles. It's, he says, it, oh, we're only on February the 9th, and we've already read these words that I'm speaking over and over again, that God goes to war for us. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, I... I, I just, I, I was humbled this morning and God's doing a work in me and I'm just sharing with you. Um, and then I'll finish up with the, I'll finish with the Proverbs. Common sense and success belong to me. Insight and strength are mine. See, these are all true statements. Of course, he's also talking about, this is wisdom speaking. But today when I read these, I didn't read them in the terms of wisdom. I read him in the terms of me. Uh, common sense and success belongs to me. God's given that to me. <clears throat> Insight and strength are mine. Because of me, kings reign and rulers make just decrees. Rulers lead with my help and nobles make righteous judgments. So we can apply that to our life right now today. Every one of us can put ourselves in those words and make that apply to what we are doing today. The stay-at-home mom leads with God's help and, and, and make righteous judgment every single day to the president of the United States, to the, from the least job that's in our mind, the least job, to the highest job, and, and which is just all human judgment. As I said yesterday, every job's important. But every one of us can see ourselves in these. I love all who love me. Those who search will surely find me. I have riches and honor as well as enduring wealth and justice. My gifts are better than gold, even the purest gold. My wage is better than sterling silver. I walk in righteousness in paths of justness, justice. I don't walk in a self-righteousness. I don't walk in an out-of-balance confidence. We serve a God of balance. We serve a God of temperance. We serve a God of justice. We serve a God that has a clear, clear definition of right and wrong. And there is no in between. Those who love me inherit wealth. I will fill their treasures. The Lord formed me from the beginning, before he created anything else. I was appointed in ages past, at the very first, before the earth began. <clears throat> I was born before the oceans were created, before the springs bubbled forth their waters, before the mountains were formed, before the hills. I was born before he had made the earth and fields and the first handfuls of soil. Mm. Thank y'all for joining me this morning. Have a wonderful weekend.